Can you give us like a summation maybe within three minutes of what the contingency argument actually is? The argument can be made in one sentence, which is a postulation. There cannot be a world with dependent things depending upon dependent things ad infinitum. That's the argument. Yes. That's my postulation. If someone agrees with this postulation, then they are invoking a need. <clears throat> the entailment of such agreement or capitulation is the need for a necessary existence or an independent thing. And if they disagree with it, then we have an argument from composition which we make. So this is the, the basic thrust of the argument. Okay, and so then when you're talking about dependent or independent things, how does one go about understanding what's meant by this? Something which is dependent is something which relies upon something else for its existence. Uh, that's different to something being caused by something else. Like for example, if I cause a house, I can cause a house, but the house can continue to exist even if I die. So if I right. cause, I can build a house, I cause it. Now, I, I can cause my child. Okay, mm. no problem. Now, I've caused a child, but it doesn't depend upon me. So in other words, it can outlive me. Now, that child can live on and I'll, I'll be dead. So yes. the child doesn't depend upon me, my existence for its own existence. So causation is defined as something which uh, is defined as something which brings rise to phenomena. There's terminological definitions, I mean, uh, but Yanni, the, the point is, is that causation is different from dependency because dependence, something can bring, bring rise to something else, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to keep existing for, for it to exist. Yes. Uh, and dependence entails, if we say it depends upon something else for its, for its existence, then it, it does actually imply continued existence. Like for example, the right. sun and the rays of the sun. So mm -hmm. the sun, the rays of the sun depend on the sun in order to sun. continue existing. So no, that makes sense. this is a this is a this is a dependency relationship, not just a causal one. So what we're saying is, we're, we're focusing on dependency here. We're not focusing yes. on causation. Although we can make the argument from causation, I don't think there's a problem. There's, you know, but we just we we for for the sake of this brevity and conciseness, we just kind of yes. like, yeah. So then how, how do you define independence? Is it just the opposite of dependence or does it have its own definition outside of dependence? Well, independent is something which is self-sufficient. So we're talking about something which is self-sufficient, something which in and of itself requires nothing else in order to exist. And that everything else in this context depends upon it for its existence. Yes. Okay, perfect. So then some might say that the necessary existence, like within this contingency argument, for example, doesn't exactly equal God or Allah. So how does one get from saying that there is a necessary existence to saying that there is Allah without being accused of a God of the gaps type, type argument? Well, look, I mean, there's only so much the necessary, the, the argument itself can actually bring you. We're not claiming that this argument is going to give you 99 attributes of God. That's certainly not <laughs> what we're saying, yeah? Yes. And in fact, we believe that as Muslims, most of the attributes of God are actually found out through the Nas, through the textual proof, which is the Quran right. and the Sunnah. Right. So uh, first and foremost, there is a point at which this argument becomes redundant, which is at points where we're trying to prove the mercy of God or the love of God, all these things. There are certain attributes which can be proved from first principles. Like we said, pre-eternality, post-eternality, will, um, we, we can we can prove independent sovereignty, qayyumiyya, samadiyya, which are which are actually plentiful in terms of the number of attributes that there are. And once these attributes are you know kind of uh, you know proven, if you like, or established, you've you've for all intents and purposes rid the individual from their atheism. The individual can no longer call themselves an atheist, and may, dare I even say, can no longer even call themselves an agnostic. So the argument aims to bring someone from the state of agnosticism or atheism to a state of deism or theism or classical theism. Now, we're not saying that's where we should stop, but that's the minimum requirement here. And then obviously we say, well, now the question is, what kind of relationship would you have with this necessary existence? And yeah. that the, the contingency argument answers half the question because it tells you that you already you are already in a dependent independent relationship so in other words you're you are in need of the necessary existence and the necessary existence is not in need of you yes the necessary existence is self-sufficient and you are not hmm. so already there are some boundaries that are being established here that there's not an equality in this relationship 
that without one the other wouldn't exist that without one the other wouldn't continue existing that without without the necessary existence anything contingent couldn't even express a contingent instantiation yes. so anything we do is with the permission of the necessary existence by necessity especially if you've ex- uh, explained the will of will of this necessary existence and so the question is what is a necessary what, what is the appropriate relationship to have except yeah. of course one of submission because yes. we're already in submission i mean submission can be established here so if submission is established a need-based relationship is established you know then we're already at a very you know promising place yes. in which case all that is really left to do you've got all these attributes of god you have the attributes of god like you know the will of god you've got the pre-eternity of god the post-eternity of god you've got the uh, the self-sufficiency of god you've got you know the oneness of god which to be fair needs a separate argumentation which is that allah did not have a son and that he doesn't have any ilah with him any god with him and had mm-hmm. that been the case that they would have tried to dominate one another and that they would have out- tried to outstrip one another in other words they cannot be two all powerful entities so once oneness is established pre-eternity is established post-eternity is established self-sufficiency is established will is established through particularization and that's another argument mm-hmm. these are all different arguments we put once all of these things are established the, the need-based relationship is established now you're ready to make the argument for the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam being the true prophet of god and the quran Fantastic. being the word of god that's what you're ready for now and no. ipso facto anything that comes from the quran therefore is true yes and because if the quran is true then anything that comes of quran in the quran especially in reference to who god is yeah is true 